Welcome to today's 90 Day Certificate Validity Panel Discussion. I'm Leah Toms, EMEA Marketing Manager at Sectigo, and I'm very excited to welcome you and our panel today. We have Tim Callen, Chief Experience Officer at Sectigo, Nick France, CTO of SSL at Sectigo, Jason Sirocco, SVP of Product at Sectigo, and last but not least, Julia Scotti, Head of Advanced Infrastructure at Worldline Global. Before we start, I wanted to talk about a few short admin points. Firstly, we're recording this, so if you do not wish to be recorded, we suggest you type any questions you might have into the question function. Um, we'll share the recording with you after the panel. Secondly, so that we don't talk over each other, I would like to ask you to raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question, and I'll appoint people to ask their questions. Or alternatively, just type into the question chat function. And we'll, of course, try to answer as many questions as we can. And with that, let's start. Tim, I believe you're going to kick us off with a short topic introduction. Yeah, a very short topic introduction. So first of all, thanks guys for joining us. And for the listeners, this is a little different from, if you've joined us in the webinars in the past, you'll know that uh, I've done a lot of these, uh, either with Nace or Nate, Jason or Nick, usually not the two of you together. Um, and we don't, um, normally we talk and we do some QA at the end. This is going to be a little different. We're also very fortunate to be joined by Julianne, who, you know, has the the real world enterprise perspective on this, which is extremely valuable. And we want to make sure that we get his take on all of this. Um, so this is a little different from our normal method. So give us the questions and keep it going, and let's have a good, robust conversation. So as as background, um, on March third, twenty twenty three. Google announced, the Google Chromium Root Store program announced on a page that it maintains called Moving Forward Together, that it intends to reduce the maximum duration of a TLS certificate to 90 days. So I'm just gonna read a little bit that's exerted. I've got a screen cap of the whole passage up above from the website, but a little bit that it's exerted here. In a future policy update or CA browser form ballot proposal, we intend to introduce a reduction of TLS server authentication subscriber certificate maximum validity, that's AKA SSL certificate, from 398 days to 90 days. Um, and if you search on Chromium moving forward together, you can see the language yourself, but it's worth pointing a couple of things out. Obviously, 90 days is a new time frame and it's much, much shorter. Uh, also, it's worth pointing out that they're gonna try to do this through a CA browser form ballot but they're prepared to take unilateral, unilateral action, which is what we mean when we say policy update, which is to say, I'm going to go ahead, I'm prepared to go ahead and make this a requirement by myself, even if the CA browser form doesn't agree to it. Um, they're also going to reduce DCV to 90 days as part of the same thing. So um, the timeline is not announced. We believe that Q4 of 2024 is the best estimate of the timeline. And we can get into why we believe that if that comes up as part of the conversation today. And uh, with that, I think we're ready to uh, start talking about Q&A around this. Brilliant. I'm going to kick us off with a starter question. 90-day um, TLS certificates will be drastically changing the digital security landscape and how it's been managed in the past. What is Sectigo's stance on it? Uh, what's our stance on uh, reducing certificates to 90 days. Yes. Nick, you're pretty passionate on this topic. You want to field that one? <laughs> yeah, I'll take that one, Tim. Thanks. Um, <laughs> I mean, quite honestly, we're very much in favor of it. You know, I, uh, Tim says I'm quite passionate about it. I, I believe it's a good idea, and I think we as Sectigo believe it's a good idea. Um, you know, Google have, uh, themselves have listed a lot of reasons why we've. It's been talked about in the past because, again, when as Tim said on the other webinars that we've done about this topic, we've covered some of the history of uh, lifetime reductions. We were at many years. We were down to three, to two, to one, and every time it's come up, there's been quite a lot of good arguments as to why it's a good thing. You know, it's it, it's definitely a positive security thing. Um, it means we can uh, be more agile and adapt more rapidly as an industry. Um, and I think those are good things. So honestly, Sectigo are behind this. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say, say the same for everybody in the industry. Um, I think, you know, there's potentially some pushback from certain areas, uh, but we certainly think it's a good thing. Um, we and we have a lot of tools and services ready to help our customers make this change and make this transition. So, yeah, I'd, I'd say Sectigo are absolutely behind it. 
I, I just want to add something to that, Nick. You know, your passion in the, in the public trust space. Uh, I got to say, same thing from the private trust space, where shortened lifespans has been a reality for quite a while. Uh, whether it's in the DevOps world or any other place that in IoT, for example, that certificates are used, uh, certificate life cycles, lifespans have been shortening, and for very a lot of very good security reasons, a lot of other good reasons as well. Uh, even in areas where revocation is difficult. Uh, it's a really good idea in those kinds of cases to reduce your certificate life cycle down quite a lot. So uh, this has been an industry trend for, for a while. And I know that this uh, question is targeted more to the Sectigo audience, but from a word line perspective, what I can say is that we work in a payment service industry. And of course, security is absolutely key. And that's why even from a payment industry, even though it, we know it's going to bring a lot of complexity, operationally speaking, a lot of things we'll most likely touch based about afterwards. On the other hand, it brings an extra very strong layer of security that we believe is necessary. In payment ecosystem, looking at how the, 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 the IT landscape is evolving towards container, which sometimes you can have certificate which are valid for one hour, all these kind of landscapes, so it all makes sense that ecosystem for both uh, public or even private certificate in certain scenarios from our point of view. Great. That's great. Has there also been any pushback that you've um, observed so far? Um, I, I don't know that we've seen a whole lot of pushback. I mean, I, I think quite honestly, while we've been doing some talking about this, um, it, it doesn't seem to have reached um, an awful lot of people, right? I mean, this isn't. Yeah. This was a fairly niche announcement, even from someone the size of Google. Um, we've been talking about it as soon as it happened. Um, I think some of the other CAs have, have written one or two articles, oh. perhaps on it. Um, Tim and myself and a few of our other colleagues were at RSA a few weeks ago, one of the big security shows in America, and I think we were the only people talking about it. Um, so I, I would say there's not been a whole lot of pushback yet because I don't think it's it's widely known right now. Um, so I have seen a little bit of of I wouldn't say pushback, but I'd say potentially some um, kind of shock. I mean, I think Julian even said it, it's something that's going to be a challenge for many people to deal with. So I've seen people say, oh, we've got work to do um but i haven't seen any necessary pushback so far but um you know maybe yeah. the other gents have seen something i think nick i I've, I've spoken to um a few people uh on the consumer side on the on the the subscriber side who have been sort of had this attitude of oh they i can't deal with this they can't do this to me and what are we going to do about this right and my response has been we're not going to do anything about it because they have the power to make this change. They have the intention to make this change. They've made it clear that they have the intention to make this change. They have a track record of following through on things that they make clear they intend to change like this. They will give us all some time to adjust. But the productive thing to do is to figure out how we are going to deal with it rather than go into denial and start claiming that it's not going to happen even though it is. I think it's Absolutely. clearly evident that Google is a, is a driving force in that area. And I also see this as a vector as transformation. What I mean by that is that the main ones that might have a lot of fear or difficulty are the ones that are much less in that DevOps format, automation, infrastructure as a code, you name it, versus the ones which are much more in a legacy system. The ones which are more in traditional infrastructure, manually deploying a certificate or whatever, will have to ask themselves the right question because if they remain in that kind of format and they move to 90 days certificate, it's of course totally uh, unbearable from an operational point of view. So I really see this rather as a game changer and forcing the industry to go faster in some certain transformation to public, private, cloud, whatever their transformation would be. Brilliant. We've got the first few questions through from our audience. Um, so the first question is, is the process of requesting and generating certificates expected to change to accommodate the increase in requests? Um, I mean, the, the, the process itself is, is fundamentally the same. Um, you know, we receive a request or a CSR, a certificate signing request. We do some processing and some vetting of the information on our side and provide the certificate back. The fundamental process isn't going to change. Um, mm -hmm. 
and I've been discussing with other colleagues that the manual process that a lot of unfortunately a lot of people go through isn't going to change what what has already changed and I think is something that people need to be more aware is available is that the process can be automated um you know we're, this change has come along now at a point in time where the the adoption of certificates is, is as wide as it's ever been but also the availability of these solutions to automate are as as available as they've ever been and um you know the process will change because people should be looking at automated solutions to do this you know i mean again julian's absolutely right there's going to be a lot of uh, people who are worried about this because they are doing things manually that process isn't going to go away you're just mm -hmm. going to have to do it five or six times a year or look at the alternatives which are the same process done by a script by a piece of code by a computer uh, and uh, done completely automatically yeah there's the automation that be... going to layer there's the automation of requesting a certificate but there's also the automation of making it auto renewed all the time and i think that's really the game changer and the next step and that's the kind of thing i was going to explain afterwards at wordline where we're already taking a drastic uh, uh, switch in that direction to make actually everything automated from a certificate life cycle so at the end of the day if google says tomorrow instead of 90 days we move to 10 days well you know what it wouldn't be so much an issue because the pipeline would anyway renew all the certificate install them on the load balancer automatically within a different time frame that we just set in the code and that has to be the way forward where the industry has to go where replacing and renewing a certificate should become a non-event down the line. That's, that's music to my ears. <laughs> and Julian, if I may ask a question. Um, so I, I, I love that vision. Some of the things that I've heard from other enterprises is to say, you know, we think we can do this for most of our cert, but there's going to be a small number of them that are in little enclaves or legacy systems or stuff, but that's going to be kind of a harder lift. Maybe that comes yeah. a little later. And I, if you're okay to talk about this, what's your viewpoint on that? Do you think that this is a phased kind of approach? Do you think that you can get it all very quickly or are there going to be some holdouts? And what do you want to do about those? Yeah, so to answer that, I'm maybe going to be, give a bit of context of our model because that okay. might explain better the direction we take. Uh, what I'm part of is a team that provides infrastructure as a code, as a platform, as a service, exactly like a public cloud provider, where it's a self-service model. Basically, the infrastructure team will provide the Terraform code as a self-service to what we call our business line, our tenant, basically our customers, which themselves, they will define what's the name of the certificate, what's the organization it's attached to, and as long as it, it's linked to a DNS name, it will automatically deploy the certificate. As soon as that certificate is deployed and it's actually on an S3 bucket on Amazon, it allows to be deployed automatically or manually on the public endpoint, being the load balancing, mm -hmm. which in our case is an HA proxy. What we have done up to today is the self-service for our customer to say, you fully own, you built, you deploy your certificate, but the only steps we ask you to do is to inform our infrastructure team at the moment you want to publicly expose it. Because then to answer back your question, Tim, there will be certain certificate which they can deploy on the fly automatically with a flag to say, I renew it and it's installed because it's not necessarily critical, I don't need to monitor, versus other certificate that they wish to monitor attentively. Because we also have the kind of uh, scenarios where customers of Wordline will even check the root of the certificate in the request they make on a server-to-server -server point of view. So this kind of scenario requires us to download the certificate like four to six weeks before, make sure that we provide the details to the customer and define a specific date to install that certificate. So these kind of scenarios and dimension mean that the population that wish to do it all in automated way, they push a flag, it just goes, it lives its life cycle. And the ones that do it with a bit more control, they can decide to, between brackets, use another flag in the automation layer to say, just deploy it, but make it ready for me to install it when I wish to install it. And that has to be the big game changer between certain kind of businesses, which will be very critical, versus the ones that you can just do on the go as long as you're in a full DevOps mode, whatever you want to call it. 
Great. Um, we've had quite a few other questions come in since. Um, first one is, how do you see this 90-day cert impacting post-quantum certificates in 2024-25 and going forward? So um, uh, Chrome was explicit about this on the Moving Forward Together page, that one of the reasons they're doing this, and it's I think it's low on the list in all honesty, but one of the reasons they're doing this is they know that a switch over to post-quantum crypto is going to have to happen. And when that happens, they want it to go more quickly. So one of the things that they believe at Chromium, and I think we completely, I would completely agree with this, is once certificates are out in the wild, unless you're going to force revocation of them, which is a bad thing, you have to assume that they're going to be used until their termination date, right? Till their expiration date. And so that means that once post-quantum crypto certs are available, for instance, and we start issuing them, if there are, there are pre-PQC certs out there, they're going to last until they run out of time. And if you reduce that time, then that switchover comes sooner. And they're very explicit about saying we saw this with the SHA-1 deprecation, right? The SHA-1 deprecation came around. We said, we're not going to issue any more certs with SHA-1. It's unsafe. And everybody said, okay, we will do that. We switched everybody over. And three years later, there were still certs out in the market with SHA-1 on them. And they said, what? <laughs> three years ago, we knew these were unsafe. Now they're three years out of date in terms of unsafe. And so that's what they wanted. That's one of the things they want to get rid of. That applies to PQC. That applies to any other fundamental foundational cryptographic change that occurs. If, if RSA were broken tomorrow and we all had to move to ECC, 90-day certs would ease that transition. If something else occurred and we realized we had to change our certs morphologically in some other way, if we needed to add more entropy to serial numbers or something like that, 90-day uh, certs would ease that transition as well. And so in general, they want uh, crypto agility. They want the whole ecosystem to migrate to upgraded cryptographic standards faster, and they view shorter certificate life cycles as one of the cornerstones in accomplishing that goal which includes PQC, but isn't limited to PQC. Right. Um, another question goes back to the one before a little bit. What about domain validation? Is this also going to be every 90 days? Yeah, that's one of the things that um, I don't think any a lot of people that read this kind of noticed that from the start. And Tim and I were discussing this just a few days after the announcement. Um, the domain validation lifetime is being reduced. You can see the nice green box on the slide in the, in the bottom right there. Um, so, and it makes sense really, it's to align the two. If you're going to verify a domain name for 12 months and then let them issue certificates for that period, it doesn't really match if the certificate lifetime is 90 days. So yes, they are bringing that down in line. Um, the one thing to note that they're not proposed to change at this point is the validation of anything else in the certificate. So if you're looking at the OV certificates or the EV certificates, that validation still takes place, but that can remain at, you know, 13 months essentially. Um, but DCV is coming down to, to 90 days. And that will be, I would say that would be one of the more challenging parts of this because that means that those domain challenges have to happen more frequently. And that means more automation with people's DNS providers or, or domain providers, domain registrars, yeah. because that's where that component takes place. Yeah, you could automate DCV validation the same way you could automate yeah. renewal. And that's definitely something we're advising people to do. But your point about OV and EV validation not changing, I think is extremely important, Nick, because if you start to imagine that you get onto, let's say, a, a two-month cadence, where every two months I'm just going to replace my cert, right? And I'm just going to do that six times a year and I'm going to run it through. That doesn't mean you go through six independent OV validation events. You do one, right? And then you do it again in a year and you do it again in a year. And that's extremely important in terms of ease of issuance, time to issuance, hassle, uh, and that's a good thing for people to be aware of. There's nothing anywhere that suggests that that reuse period is going down as part of this action. In terms of domain renewal, uh, I have actually an existing use case because we're testing that in our pre-production pre environment. The main challenge will be always to make sure that the domains are renewed before the certificate is issued 
and it's very much about making sure that the domain is renewed before you push the pipeline of the release for the deployment of the certificate itself. So the way that we see it is that we do it in two-step approach. We launch the auto renewal every uh, 60 days currently, just to make sure that it's covered before the timeline. And when this is done, then immediately one minute after, it sends a green light to the pipeline to say, I'm ready now to issue any certificate whenever you want me to. And if there's anything failing and we do continuous check on the domain validation, then it doesn't even allow anybody to deploy a certificate and not get unnecessary error in a self-service approach. Right, and then Julia, I think I've got another question, mostly probably aimed at you. How do you expect 90 day certificate lifespans to impact IT operations from like an end customer point of view? Well, it's a bit what I was explaining before. I think in terms of payment ecosystem, it makes, makes a lot of sense. Now, we do have to work with certain customers that might be afraid with that uh, concept. Uh, the ones that are in reality, normally our public set gates, our end customers, they don't have necessarily anything to do on their end because it's just an endpoint that will target a world line platform for payment ecosystem. For the ones that are the specific use cases that still do, and I'm sorry to use that term a bit, old school checking to check the root of the CA to make sure it's valid, etc. These kind of scenarios, we're gonna try to remove them as much as we can because it just doesn't reflect anymore the reality of what's happening on the market. As long as we have these kind of customers, it will bring a strain on the operations team because we have to manage them manually one by one. Now, as soon as these kind of scenarios are not anyway applicable, let's say, then it will be fully transparent for our customers and in result for our IT operation, if I make this, uh, as a just summary, it's click-click in the pipeline and you push a few uh, GitLab push and GitLab merge, and then you have your certificate exposed in a matter of a minute on your public endpoint. That's basically the result that we are expecting. If you even have to push that pipeline, if it's not already in auto-renew and you just have to do nothing, yeah, which is the next step I was talking about before. Brilliant. Um, the next question asks around the 90 days. So why was 90 days chosen and not 89 days or 57 days um, as the big step <laughs> is kind of towards shorter validity periods, but why 90 days? Is there like a threshold when we get rid of revocation? Uh, the, the, the so two separate sorry, you go ahead, Tim. So I say two separate questions. Is there a threshold when we get rid of revocation? So there actually is a ballot that is in discussion in the CA browser form right now, which was advanced by Google Chrome, that um, would establish a threshold where for certificates of not longer than 10 days term, revocation mechanisms would not need to be in place. So there is a threshold and Chrome thinks it's 10 days. Now, 90 days is not 10 days by any stretch of the imagination. So don't view this as something that will remove revocation checking. And in the 90-day world, revocation checking will still very much be a thing. Uh, why they chose 90 days? Did you have a perspective on that, Nick? <laughs> no, I, my honest answer when anybody's asked me is that, that that's what the majority of certificates are issued at today. Yeah, um, I mean, cool. if you look at all the certificates out there, it's, it's something in the 90 something percent is currently issued at 90 days. And, uh, you know, I, I think as well, because uh, someone asked me, why not go down to six months and then why not go down to three months? And I, I think the difference between three and six months for what we're talking about here is is it's minor. People would and, and the 90 day kind of forces people to look at automation more seriously. Six months might be something where people will just suck it up and go, oh, I'll do it manually for another couple of years. And then we have this whole thing again a few years after to push people down. So I, I honestly think it was almost arbitrary, but purely due to the fact that most certificates are already issued at 90 days. Yeah, I mean, and the way the question is worded, there's a suggestion where Whoever wrote the question may be kind of laughing to themselves to say, well, what's the difference between 90 days and 89 days? I, I think you have to pick a number. Why not pick a round number? Right? But if I it's think 91 days, 39 numbers. days, people would scratch their heads, right? 90 days, at least it's a round yeah. number, right? 
even. <laughs> but that, that that does bring up the point that it's 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 not going to stop at ninety, right? Ninety isn't the it, it isn't the, the the limit. They're not going to drive it to ninety, as you said, Tim. The, the the revocation being removed for certificates of 10 days and less, that's kind of an incentive for us as a CA to encourage our customers to look at shorter light times because if we don't run in a revocation infrastructure for those certs, it is a bit easier for us. Revocations are right. a difficult and quite honestly costly service to run. Um, and you could argue why revoke a certificate is going to expire in a week. So they're incentivizing shorter term certificates, but that tells us that 90 days isn't the it isn't the end goal here. We, what the end goal is, is it 10, is it seven, is it three days, is it every day? I don't think anyone knows the answer to that yet, but I think we can safely say, or I would safely say that 90 isn't going to be uh, the, the limit. We're going to see it go down further and further. And as yeah. Julian pointed out, though, once you're automated, it doesn't matter. No, it shouldn't matter. It shouldn't and matter. I would contend that 90 goals also, when you say what's the goal, it's that's a function of what kind of time horizon are you pointing out, right? Like if we all want to play science fiction games, you know, 100 years from now, are we going to be having any digital system that depends on a circuit sits around for 90 days? Absolutely not, right? So sometime between now and 100 years from now, it's gonna go down from 90 days. Is that two years from now? I doubt it, right? Is that 10 years from now? I think very much so, so now we reduce it there. So that's how you need to think about it over time, right? Is is imagine as automation becomes more and more prevalent and gets to the point where you just have to have it or you don't function, then imagine those terms getting shorter and shorter and shorter. So don't think of it as a single binary thing. Think of it as a trend. And that is a trend that is going to continue. Tim, Ed, you know, Nick, and in, in fact, Julian as well, you, you got you all know this. I think it's important for the audience to understand. Uh, there's also nothing magical about the 90-day number other than the, the technical lifespan of the certificate itself. In practical terms, it's very, very common to receive another certificate or request the next certificate within 80 days. I've even seen 70 and 60 days. Yeah. And and so what yeah. what you're seeing here is a trend within the industry. Uh, you know, From a product standpoint, this helps to inform what my team does with the roadmap. And we're looking a lot more at a continuous stream of, of SSL certificates rather than you know, thinking about purchasing individual 90-day certificates and then installing those things. That was very, very true in 10 and 15-year certificates, three-year certificates, et cetera. Now that we're down to 90 days, and we're, we've even started to talk now here even on this webinar about 10-day certificates, you really should think about this as an automated stream of certificates that are probably renewed a little less than 90 days so there's nothing truly magical about that number other than the absolute expiry date of the certificate itself has a lot less to do with the actual renewal and the mechanism of it and how you purchase those certificates and the whole ecosystem around the automation part of it absolutely well tim does that great bit on the webinar we do where people think 90 days that's four in a year well four nineties is what tim 360 I think a lot of people, Jason, I think you're right. A lot of people uh, that I've spoken to uh, are using 60 days as kind of a threshold. They want to start looking to renew at 60 days, 30 days before expiry. You know, you're talking a lot more certificates in a year than you would think. It isn't four. Um, it's it's five, six, seven, or like you say, a lot more. So it's, it's you know, it's kind of an arbitrary number, but at the same time, it, it sort of makes sense, I think. Great. There's a lot of questions around timeframes um, on when Google might put this into place. So, yeah, I'm thinking we're going back to this slide. There's a specific question around that as well that's asking, is October 2024 the date when you can keep ordering one year certificates up to that point? Or is that so when you clarify. cannot have them anymore? This is our guess. There is no announced official time frame from Chrome. There is no ballot draft in discussion so this is us guessing at time frames and my rationale on this goes as follows chrome wants to do this if they didn't want to do this they wouldn't have it on their moving forward together page so this is something they're not just going to sit around on it for years so we need to look at what would a reasonable execution time frame look like for them 
And let's 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 share a couple other factors. Number one is browsers have done this kind of thing in the past, where there was a big seismic change that they wanted to occur in the industry, and they were going to do it by root program mandate. And under those circumstances, they they understand that the industry needs time to adjust because they don't want to break things. They want to change things, but they don't really want to break things. They want everybody to transition and to work correctly. And so a year, you know, give or take a month, 30 days, 60 days, a year is usually the time they set out where they'll say, we're going to give you all a year to deal with this, right? We got a year for the S9 BRs. We got a year when Apple took us down to one year certs. We got a year when they deprecated Symantec. Like it's always a year. <laughs> and so that seems to be what, 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 what this community thinks of as a right amount of time to give the community to adjust long enough that they can make the adjustments short enough that we're not wasting time for no good reason so then you start to say okay well when when would they take this action it was march when they made this announcement it's now may and there isn't a proposed ballot yet a ballot if it goes lickety split takes about a month five weeks to get done right this ballot won't go lickety split. This is one that's gonna need dialogue and discussion and stuff, stuff like that. And right now, discussion is going on with Chrome's 10 day, reduce, remove OCSP as a requirement and you have 10 days. And if you have 10 days, you don't have to do a revocation ballot. And that is in an extended discussion period because it's a big deal and it matters a lot. And there's a lot of community discussion and they're giving it extra time. They're probably gonna promote that put forth a new draft of that ballot before you even take that to vote. They're not going to run these two ballots at the same time. So we've got to give them at least a couple months, probably three months to get all of that done. So count with me, June, July, August. All of a sudden we're in August of 2023 before we can even propose a ballot for this other thing. Now, if they're going to give us a year, it takes us a month to get done. We're into September, right? So September, October, um, the reason I settle on October is that nobody wants to make this kind of major change during the holiday season. We all know that U.S. Thanksgiving is the end of November, and that means that basically everything after November 15 is incredibly destru destructive and disruptive all the way through into well into January, right? So you probably need to get rid of all, you know, latter half of November, all of December, all of January. So if you don't make this change by Halloween, you can't make this change until Valentine's Day. They don't want to wait until Valentine's Day. So that makes me think that it's coming in October. Am I wrong? I might be. Is Chrome going to announce something? There's a face-to-face -face the week after next. They might go to them face-to-face -to -face and tell us all a date, and we might come here and say, well, the actual date is such and such. But in the absence of other information, I am picking October 15 as the day. Sounds great. Um, another question is around pricing. It's been asked several times. Do we have an idea how this could impact pricing of SSL sets? Yes, we've had a lot of talks about that. If, uh, Tim, do you have any uh, anything you want to add to that? I was going to say uh, I've been asked. I, I've been asked this on the spot on on a journalist during a live interview. He said, "So you're going to charge us four times as much money now?" And I said, "Well, first of all, it'd be five times as much money." But setting that aside, no, I don't think so. Right. So I think there's. I, I can't talk for other CAs uh, because we don't talk about these things. They make their decisions. We make our decisions. Right. Um, um, and I know that we haven't settled this yet, Jason, but I believe there's widespread recognition in our organization that this isn't, this doesn't something that causes us to jack up your price to six times what it used, would have been, right? That's not the point. And if it needs to be structured differently, if we need to count differently, if we need to do something differently that basically makes people whole, and keeps them into the in the in the in the the zone they're in now. I think there's recognition that we have to figure out a way to do that. Uh, we're talking about something that hasn't even gone into force of effect. That we don't even know what the timing is. That there's no way it's not happening in the next 365 days. We don't have a pricing list yet, right? And yeah, and we, I'm sure nobody does. 
exactly. We, we we'll are do it properly. We'll do it right where we're not, you know, extorting from from the the subscribers because that's not. No, it, in fact, we don't want to use that. To, we're not absolutely never not going to be using this to take advantage uh, of, of increasing pricing based on a certificate itself. Um, and we're also sensitive to the fact that if I'm a customer of SSL certificates, I'm really not interested in coming back every 90 days and having to to swipe a credit card, that, that sort of thing. Um, we're, we're very interested in uh, looking at subscription type services around, um, it, just like you do today, you purchase a year, you know, two years and three years worth of certificate services, and then you will receive the certificates you need during that period of time. So you're not having to come back to us if you're, this is the beauty of what Julian talked about in terms of if you're automated, that takes away all this friction around uh, not not just the renewal, not just the you know implementation of the certificate itself and all the work that, that that goes away with automation, but automation also affords you the ability to not have to go through the financial procedure and the uh, the procedure of of going through contracts and whatever else you need for certificates. Uh, so therefore, those are things that Google's not forcing the CA to do anything. That's something that we are in control of, and we're going to make that as easy as possible for the customer. We're, we're very, very sensitive to that. Great. Um, the next question is, is there guidance for automation best practices? Um, I mean, I think, yeah, there's there's probably going to be some more material we're going to be published. I know a few of our colleagues are working on um, some kind of guidelines. I mean, there are automation good automation technologies out there now good standards one of them in particular that we talk about a lot is acme right it's it's a well-defined open standard there's thousands of clients um you know you only need to go to github and search for acme and there's there's tens of thousands of repositories of people writing code that use it so that and by because it's open you'll start to see more and more vendors start to adopt it as well so instead of having sectigo to have to build software for all of these different integrations the vendors who produce this software and appliances are building integration in. So the guidelines really are to, uh, I would say, are to kind of look more around the standards that are available. You need to do some kind of assessment of, of what infrastructure you have, you know, what, what supports any automation. Because I have heard some feedback from some customers that there are places in their organization that are just well, unfortunately so old that they don't feel like it can do any automation now i think to julian's point that does force people to to go through a transformation can they get rid of these legacy systems can they change them but you still have to look at what you have try and determine what technologies you're using where and then see which ones can do some automation ideally based on standards as and ideally based on things like acme um, SCEP or EST, if it's those particular kinds of devices. Um, but it's it's really about making an assessment of what you have um, and looking to see what solutions can actually adopt the automation standards. But I'm, I'm sure Julian has some probably better advice on that one than I do, having at least been started to go through it now. Yeah, well, in terms of advice, uh... <laughs> I don't know if we had the best advice on that one because we look at it very much from an open source perspective and some might be a bit more vendor lock kind of approach uh, if I look at technologies like F5 and others. But from our perspective, the idea is always to bring an ecosystem which is coherent and completely transparent for our customers. So the way we have built our automation stack is that we call the REST API of Sectigo. We took the Terraform uh, modules that you were proposing and we just fork them and make them to our own source and we provide it as a self-service which is basically forcing populations of DevOps to just enter two free lines which is certificate name, organization and validity time. That's basically what we ask them to do and then the automation layer does the, 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 the background building it if I can call it that way. Now, of course, that's just one layer of the equation, which is only applicable for the ecosystem, which are exposed on the same kind of load balancing technology. Whenever you start hitting other technologies that are not straight, straight away plug and play with the kind of automation we're providing here, we could get into a scenario where you use a brick of the automation to at least 
issue the certificate from Sectigo and make it available in a repo, but then the installation method of the certificate could be different depending on the load balancing technology you have behind. In the context I was saying before with HA proxy, we manage everything in Puppet from a config management point of view and we deploy it that way. If you look at uh, other load balancing technology, you might do it manually or by another way, but at least the layer of contacting Sectigo getting the certificate, making it available somewhere to be used and not going through the steps, like you said, credit card or whatever, and more giving a all, all you can eat kind of buffet automation layer is the way forward. And then the way you install it on your infrastructure can be partially manual in certain scenario. Thank you. Um, and then this is probably a question for the Sectigo team. Someone's asking, does Sectigo help in implementing the automation process of cert renewal and domain ver verification? I mean, yes, I mean, we have we have automation technologies available. Um, we've had them available for a, a, a very long time, um, but obviously more recently things like the standards like Acme that we've talked about um, but yeah, we, we absolutely have all of these automation tools available and it does depend on which channel you are a customer of Sectigo. Um, you know, from an enterprise perspective, we have our enterprise platform, which uh, is what Julian and his colleagues use. Um, and that has Acme and it has other, it has APIs and have other automation options as well. If you're one of our kind of retail or our channel customers or you're, you're a partner or, or through a partner, then yeah, there's, there's automation options there as well. And we are obviously looking to bring some more options out to our channel partners and to our retail options in the future. Uh, as Jason said, that's kind of something that we're working on internally and as alongside the pricing and changing model to perhaps offering like subscription versus individual certs um, but we absolutely do we, we we have to have automation options right I mean even if we didn't have them today we would have to have them in the future but they are already available and um, without going into specifics and knowing exactly who the customer is I just suggest to reach out to us contact either your account manager um, get a hold of us through support and, and see what your options are but we we do have stuff ready today yeah Right. Um, will the Acme clients be compatible across different CAs? I think that's pretty straightforward. Yes, to be honest. Um, as I said earlier, one of the the advantages of something like Acme is because it's a, an open standard. So I said from you know I've been working with Sectigo and and previously for well, just over twenty years now, and we've had uh, APIs to be able to automate the certificate process since since I started twenty years ago. Um, they weren't standard, they were our own APIs. And so we integrate them with different customers and different business units and it works, but because they're our own, we have to document them, we have to make changes. You know, it's, it's not done in a standard way. Everybody has to develop it their own way. Since Acme came along, um, it's an open and well-defined standard. It's, it's an IETF spec, it's RFC 8555, and people can take that specification and build things to it. And as long as the CA like us or any of our other CAs that we know build the service to work on Acme, then absolutely it's it's completely compatible. So I, you know, you can take an Acme client that you would download or even write yourself, and it should work with us and any other CA that supports Acme. Now, there may be additional features that some CAs support that others don't. Um, things like the authentication mechanisms might be different, but fundamentally, if you offer an Acme service, it has to be compliant, and so the, the, the software should work from any CA with Acme. Great. Um, then the qu next question goes into private PKI. Is private PKI also impacted? It's not, I'll uh, that however, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It is not, it is not. This announcement is about publicly trusted certificates. And so when we're talking about private certificates. Those use cases are varied. And as Julian was saying, we've seen uh, certificates now down to one hour in terms of their lifespan. Uh, but those are choices made by your ecosystem. You know, those are choices you make that's, you know, the word private means it's your PKI, it's your CA that ultimately you're, you're, you're operating. It's going to have a completely different set of rules that are defined by you and you get to determine when those lifespans are. What I would say, though, is that this trend of shorter certificate life, lifespans uh, is, it's, it, it kind of started really in the private world and has now bled over into the public world and i'm i'm glad for it i think it's a it's a good trend 
but uh, to answer the question, this announcement is uh, specifically about publicly trusted certificates and not private. And Jason, if I may add to that, you see that in the wording with the box around it, policy update or see a browser form ballot proposal. That all means that they're gonna change the way the public certs are run. If they wanted to put something in Chrome or any TLS cert, regardless of the route, would stop working if it was longer than 90 days in duration, that would be a programmatic change. They could still do that. They basically write the software to say that any cert that has an end date more than 90 days after the, the begin date is just not going to be recognized, right? That's a thing from a software programming perspective that is trivially easy to do. Um, that is not what they're doing, and it's explicitly not what they're doing. So there's no reason to believe that they have any intention to change the, the, the flexibility that's available for five private root certs. <clears throat> All I'd add to that is that we would encourage anybody that uses a private CA, whether it's from us or another CA, to look at doing short lifetime certificates in general anyway. Um, I mean, I think the idea of adopting automation, yeah. going to short term certificates is is a good thing. I get, in uh, Jason, as you said, in private situations, the use cases are so varied that we, we don't know them all. Uh, and there potentially are use cases where you need to have longer lifetime certs, like, you know, embedded devices and things that you produce and then send out into the world for a few decades. Um, but those use cases aside, I think we probably encourage any of our customers to look at adopting automation and short lifetime certs, wherever they use certificates, uh, not just the public space. Yeah, it's all about transforming your public, your private, and also giving the automation layer the ability to potentially reduce any kind of wild card certificate that you could have to really have designated, dedicated certificate for your infrastructure, whatever they are, giving you ability to really secure your full ecosystem end to end, being public, private, whatever along the chain, because that's what really counts at the end. Huh? Great, thank you. Um, then someone has a fairly specific question. They manage the infrastructure, but do not manage certificates. Another organization manages them. Um, as a result, they don't have a choice for manual other than manual deployment. Is there any um, concessions for people in similar cases that might not have any input no. into how it's done? No. No, I can see Tim. I can see Tim shaking his head. These these rules come down, and they don't grant exceptions. Um, so if if there is genuinely a, I mean, it sounds like a you know a corporate organization reason for these things being handled manually. Um, I I'm afraid you know get used to the process. You'll be doing it at least six times more a year. I think is the unfortunate answer there. Um, and... Google and well any of the root programs that do this are not. They don't grant exceptions anymore. Um, I remember Tim, you mentioned SHA one and SHA two many years ago. There was mm -hmm. uh, there was some kind of vague exception process in some cases, and it just didn't work. Um, you know, the, whichever customer it was had to be kind of almost publicly shamed by whichever CA they were a customer of, and they had to ask for public permission to be able to get an exception. It simply didn't work. So uh, unfortunately, these rules are are firm when they go into effect, and there will be no kind of you know exceptions or opt outs for people. People having to do this manually and this is why the browsers give us a year right is and this is why they and this is specifically why chromium telegraphs this stuff ahead of time on their moving forward together page what they want is they want enterprises and organizations that have exactly the problem that the that the um, that the listener just put in the, the question to go away and say Folks, we've got to change our process. This is not going to be tenable. We have something on the order of 15 months to get this done. Let's start now and get it done, right? That is specifically what Chrome wants you to do. So you, question asker, go to your organization and bring this up and say, this is a process that is going to stop working. Let's start now on solving it so that when we need it to be solved, it's solved and we get there without the whole thing being a crisis. And the reason that we're out, Nick and I, Jason and I have been out telling everybody who will listen that this is coming is because we know there's plenty of enterprises that are gonna need a year to get this done. So you've got a year, great, awesome. But if you sit on your hands for the next nine months, you won't have a year. So go get started and it'll be fine. 
you don't get good started, it won't be fun. Great. Um, we had two questions that are quite similar around wildcards SSL certificates. Will they be impacted? And yeah, how to manage those? You can still get them. There's there's no change to the types of certificates being offered. So wildcards will still be there. They'll still be available. Um, for a long time now, they've really only been issuable uh, using practically using DNS-based validation or DNS-based DCV. Um, so obviously you're going to have to look how to do more automation around the DCV and working with your DNS provider as well or your DNS uh, service. Um, but there's no change to that. No, you'll still be able to get wildcards. You'll just have to get them more frequently. Great. And I think they were aiming a bit in that direction of you have obviously several subdomains to change and it would be a lot of hard work. Any advice for that? Yeah, it is going to be some. I mean, you you can validate the 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 root domain or the registrable domain name if you like. So if I you know if I own nick.com, I can verify that domain and and be able to issue a wildcard for it or able to be issued certificates for subdomains of it. Um, so that's that's certainly an option as well. But yeah, in, in general, what you're going to have to do here is you are going to have to kind of work with uh, whatever service you use for DNS. I mean, there are other methods of domain validation. Um, there's a HTTP method, there's an email based method, but really it should only be DNS that you're looking at. And that's going to be where you need to look at your DNS provider, talk to them. If it's not a service you run internally um, and see what options they have for you to be able to tie in automation and look at Acme as well, because Acme clients can do that. They can not only request the certificate, they can communicate with your DNS provider, make the requisite changes and then get the certificate validated at the same time. So the automation is all possible. It's just that uh, you will need to look at your uh, domain provider to see what you have to do there in order to get these certificates issued more frequently. OK, and then we have a question from a managed service provider that wants to hear um, whether we foresee any impact of the 90 day validity policy on compliance workloads. Uh, I mean, our compliance workload might go up a little bit <laughs> internally, but um, from a compliance perspective, it really depends on on what compliance schemes are, are, are making the you know the requirements here on certificates. I'm aware that there are some, um, you know, there are some areas that, especially when you look at things like PCI, uh, the, the PCI standard, you have to go through for taking credit card payments. There are some requirements there that are around certificates. Um, but you know, realistically, again, Jason said it best, these, these are not the certificates changing in any technical way other than it being available for, for up to 398 days. It's now only up to available 90. There isn't anything else changing about the product, how it's issued, how it works, how it operates. It, it's purely just a reduction in how long the certificate is functional for. Brilliant. OK, I think we've covered all the questions. Um, so because we have five minutes left, I thought if you could give us maybe one piece of advice that an end customer can take away, um, what they should be doing, what would it be? Oh, I got mine. Can I do you mine? Go first, then. Okay. <laughs> if you like you this got conversation, to. Jason and I run a Lego <laughs> podcast called Root Cause, and so we're getting into all kinds of stuff, including this. And I am wearing my Root Cause t shirt today. So please join us. Just search for Root Causes in the places that you go and uh, listen to our podcast. We put up two episodes most weeks. We cover all kinds of things involving PKI, encryption, security, includes things like 90 day search, Pokemon, and crypto, and a lot of stuff we talked about today. That's my advice. Good advice. <laughs> The only I think mine honestly would, is um, oh you go ahead Julian please the only advice I would give as a yeah as an organization is if you have to go through the hurdle of anyway going through automation do it right but do it well ask yourself the right question what am I trying to solve and what's my means to solve it if it's just to put the script somewhere that runs only when the server is up or whatever to download your certificate you're missing the point. The idea is really to go one next step into the way that you secure both your, your applications, your infrastructure, whatever element of your equation of how you provide your service to your customers and bring that very much into a DevOps approach or whatever you want to call it, which is all infrastructure as a code being public 
public cloud, private cloud, whatever they are, but ask yourself the right question, what you're trying to achieve, and don't forget one very important layer, the alerting layer. How you get notified when a certificate will expire, and what kind of trigger will it create in the organization, and who are the right stakeholders that need to be notified about it. Because the, the shorter the certificate expire, the faster you need to make sure people are aware, if it's not in the case of an auto-renew certificate, and when they are aware, that they have the ability themselves to renew the certificate, that they don't then depend on some process where it already takes 30 days to get the ticket issued to another team that will do it. Then, of course, you might be in danger in certain scenarios. I think my, my advice is going to be kind of general, but my advice is honestly start to look at this now. Um, I said we, we, we've spoken to a lot of customers, we've, we've done shows, we've done webinars, and we've seen these changes happen in the past, industry-wide changes, whether it's other reductions in lifetime, whether it's changes from one algorithm to the other. And a, a lot of people do leave it to the last minute, or they don't think it's going to be something that will impact them, and then they find out either when it's too late or whether they have too few days to do anything about. And I, I've said this a lot internally and externally. I believe this is one of the most significant changes our industry will have and, and I've seen in the, my 20 years doing this. Right. And for better or for worse, uh, Sectigo and other CAs like us are critical to the function of the internet and, and in many ways function of most people's modern lives because the, the TLS and everything that we help to provide just makes the internet work. It makes mobile devices, your phones and everything work. And so it's going to be such an impactful change. You have to start looking at this now. Yeah, even if you don't know what you're going to do, I mean, Julian's advice is fantastic, but even if you're not at a position where you can start to think like that, you start to have to assess now and, and speak to whoever your CA is. If it's us, pick up the phone. If it's someone else, do the same there, but start looking at this today because there may be some huge changes you need to make and we don't know when this is going to happen. 15 months might be an outside guess, it might come sooner. So there's no time but the present to get started on making these changes. My advice here is very short and sweet. It's along the line of, of what Tim was talking about with in terms of the Root Causes podcast. I want to draw you very specifically to Root Causes episode 304, where we talk about the 90-day SSL certificates checklist. And that is real actionable advice that you can take right now so what everybody just said get going start now uh at root causes episode 304 tells you exactly you know what you really should be doing first anything in security always starts with inventory uh, might sound obvious but so, some of you might need to really hear that and take that to heart but the rest of the actionable advice root causes episode 304 please check it out and you make a great conclusion there, Jason. We also are going to have a new webinar around that preparedness, similar to that um, podcast episode on 22nd of June. So we'd love for you to join us again. Um, but yeah, for that, I would like to wrap it up for today. Thank you all for um, telling us all your insights for this panel. And thank you for listening to our audience.